Recently, I came across several of these Johnny Lightning, the greatest generation military vehicles, and picked them up. As someone who enjoys modeling and 164 scale die cast, I could not resist the temptation of doing some videos detailing these models out. I decided to start with this Willis Jeep, mostly because I wanted the resin diorama that came with it for the follow up videos. It appears Johnny Lightning made two resin dioramas for this set. This one representing the Steeds of Baston, and another one called the Chateau that comes with the Sherman tank and is currently being shipped to me. Both resin dioramas are really cool. Johnny Lightning put in quite a bit of detail in each one. I really like the Kilroy graffiti on the door. It's a nice touch and sort of a wink and a nod to the soldiers. If you're unfamiliar with Kilroy, I'll leave a link below to a video about him. In short, it was an early World War II meme that soldiers would draw on walls and surfaces as they passed through an area. If you get some free time, you should definitely check it out. Looking at the Jeep itself, the first thing I notice is that it has some mass to it. Other than the interior, and well the wheels and other details, the entire thing is metal. It's very well put together, so well in fact that I didn't even notice it had an opening hood till I took it apart and saw the hinge inside. There's a chance the plastic windshield frame would fall forward like the real Jeep, but I never got the guts to push hard enough given how delicate it is. Overall, the Jeep is very detailed. Items that would normally be cast into the body like the shovel and gas tank have been cast separately and then added on. The Jeep sports real rubber tires except for the spare which is cast in plastic. I'm not an expert on this or any military vehicle but I will say that looking at pictures online it seems Johnny Lightning nailed it as far as most of the details go. The only complaint I can level at this casting is that the steering wheel almost touches the driver's side seat so there is a scaling issue somewhere. I would guess that the steering wheel may be a bit too big. I began by taking the Jeep apart. Really this could be optional here as I'm not going to repaint this Jeep and instead we'll be using weathering and other detailing techniques to just add realism to it. But I will say it was much easier to work on with it apart. Once I got it apart I found that it had a rather simple design which is pretty normal for these display type cars. They're not expecting kids to send them down a track or anything. I should note that Johnny Lightning did not leave much meat in the post that it used on his Jeep. As such, getting the Jeep back together proved to be a bit difficult. As I said before, the Jeep does have an opening hood. Once I found this out, I discovered that it also had a nicely detailed engine. I also discovered that the interior was assembled from two parts. Though I had some difficulty in separating them, it was definitely worth the effort as it made detailing them much easier. With a project like this you could start really anywhere, but I thought I would start with the interior for once. The first thing I wanted to do is look at the seats. In a real Jeep, the seats were made of a foam covered in canvas. No doubt cheap and easy to manufacture and replace. Johnny Lightning highlighted this detail by painting them a light green color. Since the seats are designed flat and slightly raised, I thought I could use some real fabric to represent them. So at the local craft store I found some fabric that had a tight pattern and was roughly the correct color. Using a pair of calipers I can measure each seat and then cut a piece of fabric to match. In my case the fabric has a different weave on each side so I had to take care not to mix them up when I glued them on. I use regular super glue as it sets up fast and holds fabric really well. Some of the glue would bleed through the fabric but in this case it was fine if not desirable as the whole idea here is to make this Jeep look used and abused. It took some time but eventually I had all the seats covered. For the top portions of the seat I rolled the fabric over and glued it down. This was just to give the cushions a sense of thickness and depth. It can't be understated how changing the textures of items like this really adds to the overall detail and look of the model. These details draw in the eye and give the impression that the Jeep has actually been shrunk down. Next I'll use a small paint pen to color in what I assume are dials on the floorboard. It's sort of unlikely you'll be able to see these later given their size and the fact that they'll be mostly hidden by the dash, but I'll go ahead and paint them in. I couldn't find any close-up pictures of this area online, so I'm not sure what each of these knobs represent. The three sticks are correct though. I assume there are gear shift, four-wheel drive, and high-low, but I'm not for certain. If you know, please let us know below. For a couple of the dials on the dash, I'll apply some red enamel. I'm rather certain there was no red dials or lights on the dash, but here I'm taking some creative license and adding in some small amount of color. Once again, this is just here to capture your eye when you scan over the dash. Next I'll use the paint pen to paint the steering wheel and the steering column black, as this is the color that they should be. 
I will also use the paint pen to paint in some of the other small details on the dash like the metal clips used to hold the windshield in place. Since I'm not painting this car and don't want to destroy the decals, I'll be completely relying on washes and powders for the look I wish to achieve. Here I'll start with a sepia tone wash that I'll apply all over the entire interior, including the fabric. Washes are diluted paint and when they're thin they look transparent but become opaque in areas that they pull. The areas they tend to pull in are panel lines and around sharp corners. I think of washes like a artist thinks of shading and shadows. It brings depth to whatever you apply it to. When they dry they tend to lighten in color until you clear coat over them so keep that in mind. Washes are extremely forgiving. If you dislike how the wash looks, you can remove it with isopropyl alcohol and start over. Washes are also random for the most part, or I should say the look is random. You can always apply more or puddle the wash in one place to darken, so you do have some control, but for the most part, every time you apply the wash, you'll get a different look. After the wash dries, I'll clear coat with Tester's Matte Clear Coat. This will set the wash, so I'll not be able to change it after the clear coat. Setting the wash is important though, as other washes and paints can remove it, including even touching the car. The color coat is also important here for the fabric, as it will bind all the fibers together and hold them in place. While the clear coat dries, I'll start working on the main body of the Jeep, starting with the gas can and the spare tire. I'll start by applying the rust powder with a makeup applicator, but I found that this was not really getting me anywhere. So I then upgraded to a cotton swab that I wet with some isopropyl alcohol. The alcohol will dissolve some of the powder and allow me to use it more like a wash. I first went over the tank with the darker rust color and then went over it again with the orange rust color in an attempt to mix them up. I sort of got the look I wanted, but I know I'll have to come back later to touch it up. But this works fine now as an undercoat. So now I'll turn my attention to the ax and shovel. Like the gas tank and spare, I really need to put some effort in the details of these two items as they're items that I can paint a color other than green. I'll start with a chrome pin to detail the metal parts of both. Now I'm fully aware that these items would not be shiny and were probably painted green to blend in with the Jeep. You obviously don't want a shiny piece of metal giving away your position. But don't worry, I still have to apply a wash and a clear coat over these parts and the clear coat will take the chrome to a dull silver. Dull silver is not exactly accurate either, but here again I'll be choosing creative details over historic accuracy. If it helps, you can assume the soldiers rubbed off all the paint digging foxholes and cutting brush. While the paint and ink dried, I went ahead and painted in the tail lights using a toothpick and red enamel. Here again, any chance to add in other colors is welcome. For the engine, I'll use another wash. This known oil is a much darker wash than the sepia and looks like engine grime when it dries. Now at this point, I'm starting to notice an issue with the hood. As I said before, it fits really well, too well. The hood actually hits the body below the windshield and has started to remove the factory paint. This is not good given that I still plan to add other layers on top, so unfortunately this will be the last time I open the hood as I don't want it to destroy my work. But anyway, I tell you this in case you own one of these and don't want your paint scratched up. Since we're on the subject of washes, I'll go ahead and start washing the entire body with the sepia I used on the interior. Except for the windshield, I'll be sure to cover everything, taking care to cover the decals the way that I want them to look, dirty but still readable. When I'm done, I'll set the body aside to dry. After about an hour of dry time, I'll go over the entire body with a black weathering powder. This will give all the edges a slight black tone to them that I find helps blend everything together. In a way, we're highlighting things in black. Sort of strange, but it works really well. I also washed the base, and after that dried, I decided to rust out some of the details with an enamel weathering pin. These you just shake for 30 seconds and then apply to the item you want to rust. Really I'm doing this in the wrong order. I should have applied the rust and then apply the wash. So off camera after the rust dries I'll reapply the wash. The reason you want to do the rust first is because the wash represents dirt and grime. That would be covering everything. And also the wash blends in all the transition lines between the rust and the green body. Which is very useful for hiding lines and my mistakes. The last thing I'll do to the body is apply small amounts of rust to items that might rust. This includes the small bolts on the side of the Jeep, the metal band and box that holds the gas tank, and the fasteners that hold the shovel and axe. Once these items dry, I will apply a coat of Tester's Matte Clear Coat to the body and the base and then set these parts aside to dry for about an hour. So here's a quick look at how things are going so far. I had some issues getting the Jeep back together. This was mainly due to the small post that Johnny Lightning uses. 
I had to use some really small screws to hold everything together and as such I'm not really wanting to take this car back apart. But no big deal as everything else I want to do can be done with the car together. Now I really like the way that the Jeep looks but I want to add in another small detail to go along with the tank, shovels and such. I want to make a small blanket or canvas tarp that would be stored on the side next to the back seat. Just a small detail but something that will really make the model pop. To make these I use leather. I use leather because of its texture, the ability to dye it, and also because it's easy to shape when wet. Since the blanket slash tarp needs to have a fluffy texture, I'll use a leather shaver to shave off a thin slice off the back of a leather strip. Then using some scissors I'll cut the leather to size. Then I'll dye it using some acrylic paint. Leather is very dry and soaks up liquids easily. When it does this, it also gets really soft and supple, allowing me to easily roll it up into a shape I want. If I hold the shape until it dries, it will permanently take on this shape unless you add water again. This will be fine here, but I want to add more detail, so I'll use some plastic string to bind the blanket and hold it in a roll. These plastic strings come from glow stick packages and are used to make a necklace. Since they go around kids' necks, they need to be easily stretched and broken. As such, they thin out when stretched out. This means I can tie them into a really small knot, a much smaller knot than what you could get out of a string of the same diameter. Plus, the plastic string is easy to cut with a sharp object. I find this stuff to be really useful in modeling. The last thing to do is to glue the item into the back of the Jeep with some super glue. So now we're at the last, but one of the more fun steps, mud and dirt. The mud and dirt step can fix most of the problems in this sort of model. Did you accidentally drop the model and need to hide a huge gash? Mud and dirt. Luckily I'm not in need of hiding any issues, so I'll be going light on the mud and dirt because I already have a lot of dark tones in this model. In fact, I'm mostly just going to use it for texture. To make mud and dirt, you take a dark weathering powder and mix in a dark paint. This will create a slurry that you can then start painting in the areas you wanted. Once you have the mud in place, you can dip your brush in the weathering powder and apply it directly to the mud. The two will bond together, holding the dirt or weathering powder in place. If you like, you can clear coat over it, but I find that it holds pretty well as long as you're not touching it. In this case, most of the dirt is going in the wheel wells and won't be touched there anyway. The dirt adds texture to the model, and as I said before, texture goes a long way in making things look real, probably because texture is what your brain would expect. Once the mud and dirt dries, this model is done. A couple of things I caught after filming and was able to fix was my mistaking the orange side indicators for gas tank caps. It seems like they would have had the ability to fill up on both sides, but they're not lids, they're just side indicators. Sort of surprised Johnny Lightning didn't paint them in. I'm thinking of adding a rope to the front bumper. It seems that was a common thing to do and would definitely be a cool detail to add. At the end of this series, I'll show all the vehicles off so you'll get to see any changes I made to any of them. Speaking of the series, my plan is to give this treatment to all the rest of the military vehicles Johnny Lightning made. And if that goes well, I'll even do the Grit and Steel series after this one. It all really depends on whether or not you guys like this sort of thing as it is a small departure from my normal fare. So let me know below your thoughts and ideas on this model and whether you want to see more. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.